and welcome back to my channel. Um, I'm just going to be doing one video today. Um, I was originally going to do two, but my, I'm, I'm quite pressed for time because I've got to go out again later on um, for uh, an appointment. Um, so I'm just going to do one video today, um, but what I don't do today, which is still on my list to do, like some more recipes and um, looking at a magazine I've read recently, I will be doing in following weeks, so, you, so I'll still be doing those other things I've planned on doing. So today uh, I'm just going to review this book which I read recently called Priest and the Squid, The Story and Science of the Reading Brain. Hey, okay, hope you can see that. Um, I actually got this book um, last year. Funny enough, I found it in the works in Portsmouth when I went on an excursion to Portsmouth on an outing. Um, but it took me until just a couple of weeks ago to actually read the book. It was, it was just waiting for me to read and I wanted it, but it wasn't had to be in a quick mood, right mood, to actually read it. Um, it's kind of popular science-y. It's by someone called Marianne Wolfe. Um, I did find it quite interesting, um, but I felt maybe she could have gone into certain areas in a little bit more detail, a little bit more depth. Um, I thought she skimmed over some of the issues, and I would have liked, liked a little bit to know a little bit more about some of the issues raised. Um... But, as I say, it's only a popular science book, so you're not going to expect it to be really detailed or anything like that. Um, but I did, um, um, it was quite interesting. I'll just find my notes now, because I took some notes in it, which I'll just uh, read out now, so I could do a review. Here we are. So it's about the history of reading, um, both culturally and historically, and also um, on a personal level as well, where she explores the developmental history of reading in the individual reader, you know, um, from when... Um, books are first introduced to the child um, and right through you know to becoming a novice reader to becoming a decoding reader um, and to becoming an expert fluent reader. Um, part of the reason why I read the book of course is because I do I do read a lot um, particularly now I'm an adult um, I would say that um, you know I, I've developed quite a lot with my reading um, and um, but and, and, and I'm, you know, I do, I would say I read a lot more now as an adult than I did as a child. Um, so that's part of the reason why I got that book, is just to find out a little bit more about reading, because it looked quite interesting when I saw it. Now, I do have a love-hate relationship with reading. Although I read a lot, I wouldn't say that I really, really love reading, or really, really enjoy reading. I mean, I enjoy getting knowledge and information out of reading, and it satiates my curiosity, my sort of intellectual curiosity. But reading itself is very, very hard work. Um, it really, uh, part, of, part of the reason it's hard work is because I do find it very hard to focus my attention. Um, my attention is kind of like all or nothing. It's like a razor beam. It has to focus intensively on something for myself to really understand something. But that obviously takes up a lot of energy. And also my attention is very, it's very hard. It involves a lot of resources, a lot of inner effort to keep my attention on what I'm trying to focus on because I'm very, very easily distracted by sounds, by other things going on in my visual field. So it, that, that does require a lot of effort. So I would say it's not 100% enjoyable. I, I really wish, I, I really envy those people. Like sometimes when I'm just walking and I see people sitting on a bench just reading quietly and they seem really immersed in a book and you hear people talking about how reading for them is a really, like, yeah, really immersive experience where I could just block out everything else and really enter the story. Um, I can't do that because I'm so easily distracted um, and also I can't read quietly because I don't, I, if I were to read quietly, um, I mean, I just see the words and I do, ha and, I, and I can, I can piece together some meaning and I mean like for example when I'm at certain meetings I will try and read quietly because I'm trying to mask and I don't want to look odd. But, it, it, but I'm not getting as much information as I would as if I were to read aloud and I can't read complex text in that way and certainly I don't get much information from trying to read silently um, because, I, um, because it's really distracting and um, it's hard for me to generate an inner voice in my head so I have to kind of like read aloud um, to really understand it. Um, so yeah, reading is hard work and it does take me a while to process what I read. I do have to read sentences quite a few times over out loud to allow the meaning to sink in. Often the first time I'm reading a sentence, like it, I, I, I ha in order for it to really be consolidated, I have to reread it again. And often, I, if I don't do that, I'll forget what I've just read and the meaning will just fall apart because, like, I could easily forget what the sentence 
that I've just read has actually said until I've really absorbed the meaning. Otherwise, it's only like half baked. And although I, although I'm, although I understand exactly what each word, what each individual word is saying on that level, in order to piece together a full understanding of what I'm reading in a text, I do have to read something quite um, several times over, um, whispering it out loud in order for me to really understand what I've just read um, in a certain, you know, in that wider sense. Um, so yeah, it can, it can take me a while to retrieve the meaning of a written word in my head as well. Um, you know, I do, I do have difficulties processing visual information and I think that probably is partly why. Um, I am quite, I do need to hear it as well as see it. If I were to just see it, it, it doesn't quite sink in. And also, of course, vice versa. I do need to sort of, in a sense, to really understand something, I need to both see it and hear it. Um, now, reading relies heavily on visual perception. Um, visual perception is one of my weaker strengths, as was highlighted in um, my recent assessment and also going back to when I was a child as well. And it was noticed that I've always had problems with visual perception. Um, so I do think that's probably why reading is so hard work for me. I mean, reading is very visual. Um, now, I can read very well on a mechanical level. I have no problems decoding text. I can read incredibly fast. And... Um, this was what really confused them when I was a child, and part of the reason why I was called an enigma is because um, I, I learned to read fairly young, albeit, you know, with parental instruction, but I did learn to read relatively young, certainly by the time I began school at the age of four. You know, my, my reading ability, my mechanical reading ability was pretty good, and um, just got better as I got older, and by the age of ten, my mechanical reading ability was out of a 15-year-old. However, I was kept back on level one reading, which my mum found very frustrating because when I had to do reading after school, instead of going, instead of reading books at, at the level of my mechanical reading age, which was five years advanced, I was being kept back on level one. And the reason for that was I did not understand what I was reading. I had zero comprehension. And this really concerned me when I was at school. It's so like I could read because normally in like typical development, it's usually expected that if a child can read mechanically and can decode text fluently. They should be able to understand what they're reading, but for me that wasn't the case. Um, so, um, so yeah. So I mean, I do struggle to instinctively hold on to what I'm reading and to visualise the meaning. I've always had this difficulty, um, and as I say, as a child, I really struggled with comprehension. That was flagged up as a cause for concern. As an adult, however, I would say that I have learned to, how to compensate. My comprehension is obviously a lot better than when I was a child. And um, and I think the reason for this is I've learned, I've simply learned how to compensate. I still struggle to, uh, to get the meaning out of a text, but I've learned to compensate. And for re how I've learned to compensate is I read aloud. I think when I was a child, I didn't realise, I, I, you know, I was trying to focus on silent reading because that's what you're encouraged to do, isn't it? After a certain age, I mean, little children read aloud, but after a certain age, you're encouraged to read quietly. Um and um reading quietly is oh my god it is so effortful i just can't tell you it's really really hard work um almost as hard as maths um which is a, a real difficult to have not as quite as hard as maths but it's quite hard um because when i'm reading aloud it's just silent letters silent words i could i could i could i know what i'm reading but i can't get any meaning out of it so i can i can read the words in my head but i'm not getting any meaning out of it if that makes sense um and it can be quite hard for me to focus on the text, you know. Um, so reading aloud kind of like helps me helps me keep a tab on where I am in a book because otherwise my eyes tend to just wander all over the place and I lose track of where I actually am. Um, and so reading aloud really draws out the meaning. It's still hard for me to understand. I think the other compensatory tactic I've done is rereading. Um, I've learned to reread a sentence several times over to really drag that meaning out there, but it's such, it's not a natural process, and this is why I said I've got a love-hate relationship with reading. I love reading because I like gaining knowledge, and for written word is where I'm most comfortable, but reading itself is quite a visual activity. Visual activities are one of my weaker sides, uh, is a weaker, weaker, you know, visual perception difficulties and all that, so, you know, that's where it is at the same time quite stressful. Um particularly with all that issues with processing noise and competing information and the way my attention tends to wander all over the place, which makes it even harder. Uh, so, yeah, so it is very much a love-hate relationship. Um, but, yes, yeah, so I've learned how to compensate. So, certainly as an adult, my comprehension now is probably more or less commensurate uh, with my reading age, although I do still struggle 
um, with processing the meaning and that's why I have to reread several times. I also um, know how to use commentaries off of people's notes. Spark Notes is brilliant because that helps me understand, you know, nuance. I'm getting better at understanding nuance. I think also things like metaphor might have been also the reason why I struggled as a child. But as I've got older, I've learned how to compensate for that by reading commentaries. And I've and also I have got a lot better at um, uh, at, at looking for subtext and things like that. Because, you know, as I've got older, my intellect has developed and I've, I've got a lot better at that over time. So my comprehension with, with the written word, with, with books, isn't as bad as it used to be. No way, it's a lot better. You know, I'm pretty good at that now, I would say, with a little help for my commentaries. Um... And when I did, for example, when I did a review of Invisible Man earlier on, um, a lot of that came from Spark Notes, but Spark Notes is really, really helpful. I wouldn't have been able to do that book review all on my own. I had to use a commentary. Um, where was I? Yeah, so as I say, reading is not completely enjoyable. Um, so now, interestingly, uh, this book explains that reading is not natural. Reading is actually not unnatural for any of us because the brain was never actually originally designed to read. Reading relies on a brain's ability to adapt to new cultural inventions by making new connections among circuits that were originally designed for older processes such as vision and spoken language. The brain's ability to um, uh, use old structures for new um, for new processes is, is, is known in science as neuronal recycling. This refers to the way the brain can recruit circuits designed for other tasks to activities such as reading. The brain is plastic and adaptable. The book argues that the reading brain exploited older neuronal pathways originally designed for connecting vision to conceptual functions, such as connecting for quick recognition of a shape with a rapid inference that this footprint can signal danger. The ability to read also heavily utilises the brain's auditory regions because reading is facilitated by the child's growing awareness of the sounds of speech, which enables children to hear and analyse phonemes. And I think this is the reason why, on the decoding level, I can read, I can read well, because um, my auditory strength, for good, and, for good and for bad, is my um, most in acute sense, and that can cause me all sorts of problems. Um, but it also means, obviously, that I am very, I can very finely attune myself to the details um, of auditory um, input. Uh, so, yeah, so analysing phonemes, I think I was pretty good at that as a child. I mean, I learned to read in the sense of being able to decode words fairly young, as I've said already. Um, and I suspect that this ability was facilitated by my oversensitivity to auditory detail. Yet, I have always struggled to make... I've already said this, but I've got to say it again. I've always struggled to make instinctive sense of what I read, and so I was held back on level one because my comprehension was around seven years behind my mechanical reading age. That's a really big goal for this big spiky profile I had, which is actually quite characteristic of in autism, um, for what I for what I now know. Um, now this book highlights that it was the ancient Greeks who discovered that oral language could be analysed and segmented into individual sounds via the alphabetic code. Um, I mean, if you think about it, it's a really genius invention to actually have an alphabetic code where each um, letter in, the, in that code corresponds with a sound. It's genius. The brain has to isolate individual sounds from the continuous babble of speech, and this is why an unknown foreign language is so incomprehensible as all the sounds merge into one another. Interestingly, early exposure to poems and nursery rhymes prepares a child to read because exposure to melody and rhythm helps develop phoneme awareness skills. As a child, my dad often sang me poems, even things such as, because my dad was an English teacher, he's tired now, but things such as Keats' Odes to Autumn. I mean, I could sing that song. I knew that song pretty much off by heart. I didn't understand the meaning, obviously, but I could sing it off by heart at the age of four years old. I remember singing it in a weeding corner at school. I used to just go off into the weeding corner all by myself because I had no one to play with, no friends or anything. I used to take myself off into the weeding corner. I used to in reception class, and I would just sit there on my own singing these poems. I don't know what the teacher thought. <laughs> but, yeah, so I often sang um, songs and poems. So I think that must have helped me. Now, with regards to comprehension... One of my major struggles, the book, um, certainly as a child is one of my major struggles, not so much these days, but I still find it difficult. The book discusses how a knowledge of multiple meanings enhances comprehension. 
In order to understand a text, we need to understand a word's multiple uses and functions in different contexts. For example, knowing that a bug could be something that crawls, pesters or spies on people. Now, as I've already mentioned, I've got a lot better over the years at this level of comprehension. So I would say, you know, I... Although it doesn't always come naturally to me, I think I've just learned compensatory strategies, my intellect has developed, and within a written text, I've become a lot better at this. So, you know, it's not such an issue these days in the written text. Um, so, I mean, at least in books, um, I can reread a sentence and allow myself extra time for processing, which I think is critical. Books do allow you that luxury of time. Reading comprehension also involves many other processes, such as inferring what a given scenario involves, predicting what a character will do, this is particularly so for fiction, which is part of the reason why obviously reading factual stuff can be a bit easier, although it can still be difficult sometimes, or feeling the same emotions as a character. I've always struggled with these processes, and I think this highlights the way in which my autism has affected my reading. The book also explains that working memory provides a temporary space for holding information about letters and words just long enough so your brain can connect it to the conceptual information. The brain can then direct attention to making inferences and predictions. Now, I have difficulties with my working memory, and that was highlighted in a recent assessment. And my working memory does lag, it's, it's a lot lower than what would be expected given my um, very high verbal intelligence. And these difficulties um, also overlap with my maths difficulty disability. I suspect that my maths difficulty is um, heavily connected to these working memory difficulties. Um, and I, I think there's probably some overlap here with my problems historically with comprehension. And I guess it could be connected to working memory deficit. Now, I'm pretty certain, having read this book, um, sorry, <laughs> having read this book, my poor working memory was at least partly behind my reading comprehension difficulties at school along with my difficulties in understanding metaphor and multiple meanings caused by the autism. So, I hope you've enjoyed my review today. Um, yes, it was quite an interesting book. As I say, I, I would have liked it maybe if it's a little bit more detailed, because some of the things I thought, oh, I'd quite like to know a little bit more about this, but as I say, it's only a, um, a, a book designed for the popular market. You can hardly expect it to be that detailed. And, um, you know, for what it was worth, it was... Quite an enjoyable book. It certainly got me thinking about reading and all the processes that go into reading that we often don't think about and how, you know, we were never designed to read in the first place and this was an adaptation that the brain made to um, evolving historical circumstances, that reading was a cultural invention and it could have been otherwise and the brain simply adapted. I thought all that was very, very fascinating. So I hope you enjoyed my book review today. As I say, um, just one video today, but I will be back next week. I haven't decided yet what I'm going to talk about next week. Um... Possibly I might do a magazine review because I've read the National Autistic Society's latest membership magazine. I might do a quick skim of that and I've also got some recipes that I'd like to update you on. Um, so do give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed listen watching it. Um, I um, Do comment in the comments box below and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Let other people know about the existence of this channel and I hope and I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. So thank you for watching.